Welcome to the City Current Radio Show. I'm your host, Andrew Bartolotta. Today, we have the privilege of speaking with Fortune 50 leader and author of the book, What About Me? Walking the Tightrope as a Black Man in America, D. John Jackson. John, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure, Andrew. Glad to be with you. Give listeners an idea for your career and expertise as a Fortune 50 leader in strategic planning, engineering, and more. I have a wonderful career. Uh, I've had a chance to see quite a few things uh, in engineering, strategic planning, globally, uh, in artificial intelligence, uh, things of that sort, things that are really exciting and the cutting edge of technology. And I've been very fortunate and very blessed to have the opportunity and the gift to be able to navigate in those spaces. Uh, but as time rolled along, I felt that there was more that I wanted to do. I wanted to give back and pour more into the ethos of this world about how we can look at human beings and help. And, you know, this evolution has just taken place. But, you know, yeah, very exciting career, uh, continuing to do that, but wanted to do even more to give back. Written specifically for young Black men and boys in America today, your book, What About Me, speaks to and for all marginalized or underrepresented voices with a call of courage and perseverance. What made you decide to become an author? You know, one of the things, it's my parents, the way they taught me. You know, my parents were very, very influential. They taught me and my brother and sisters that respect everyone. Uh, there should be respect regardless of race, color, creed, socioeconomic status, gender. And they always tried to live by example. They expose us to all kinds of people and always emphasizing the respect. And that's just been a part of me. That's just been a core of my fiber. And as you start to grow older, you start to experience things, you see things. And I just thought I need to write about what they taught me and in my experiences. And then how could I possibly educate, encourage, and inspire others? You know, Black men and boys, uh, any people of color, women, anyone who feels like their story has been misunderstood or marginalized, how can they learn from my stories and my lessons and forge ahead? And by forging ahead, that means, you know, standing strong and wherever you start from, you can achieve. And so really the book is a feel good book it's a narrative, it's about stories, but it's how to inspire people that they can overcome and do just uh, as well as I've done or even more. Now the book also has an accompanying documentary. Talk about that. The book is really about my life, how I was raised, those things that my parents taught me and then my experiences, the good, the bad and the ugly and how I had to deal with those and what I learned and really at some point ask the question of, wow, why, is, why are these things happening to me? But at some point having that epiphany that, guess what? I can use these things to help others. And so it turns into that story that I talk about, how to encourage and inspire. The documentary talks about a broader spectrum of African-American men and boys. What are their experiences? How do we hone in on their untold stories, the things that they experience? And to show that they're not monolithic. You know, the documentary speaks to I've got attorneys, I've got stars, I've got people in college, and there's this age old myth in media, mass media, that typically black men and boys have three categories. You know, they're stars, they're athletes, or they're on the wrong side of the law, and that's pretty much it. And so what the documentary does is expound upon those individuals. You know, they're great bankers or attorneys, uh, you know, they can be carpenters, they can be uh, craftsmen, uh, they've got ideas, they've got feelings, they're good fathers, you know, they're good bankers, you know, all of those things that typically are not exposed. So I'm really showing both sides, the book being about my life and how it, it's interwoven into the rest of these experiences that others have, but then focusing here on the story that usually doesn't get told in mass media. Well, and I also like that you don't shy away from vulnerable conversations around racism, privilege, you say um, that education about history is key to understanding the root of racism and knowing how to dismantle it. Why do you think Americans are so uneducated about their history and how can we uh, remedy this unfortunate truth? Well, I'll tell you, Andrew, on top of being an engineer, a scientist, futurist, and all these kind of things, history was probably my first love for my parents just early on, learning history and reading history and trying to understand not only the, the political sides of history, but the human aspect, the human toll. And so one of the things I, I feel is that, you know, in certain ways and cultures, the true facts don't ever come out because actually they're not discussed, they're not taught. And the example that I use in a lot of my speeches that is that the issue of racism and the things that have transpired are like a problem, really tough, a really tough problem, a math problem as an analogy. 
And the only way you solve a tough math problem, whether it's calculus or chemistry or physics, you have to have the facts. And by having the facts, you can bring a good people, uh, a group of people together to get a great solution. You may not like all the facts, but you can get to the solution for the problem. And I see that you know, with these issues and ills that we face today, whether it's you know microaggressions, it's racism, it's these issues of uh, conflict. And I think if you get the facts and then people learn, that's the base layer. And then once you learn, how do we do better? And so that's why I think history is so important to understand the fact. I've been just in the last year or so, I've had so many people say, I didn't know, I didn't understand. And you know, gosh, shame on us for not, not explaining those things, but some of those things are hard to deal with. And I think, again, back to my math problem, sometimes the facts are hard to deal with because they are lead you to the solution. But here's the deal. There have to be consistent facts. If we were a group of scientists and we were solving a tough chemistry problem, and if half of the room said, wow, water freezes at 19 degrees Fahrenheit, and one half says, no, it freezes at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And then there's a group that says, no, it's proven. It's scientific fact. It's 32 degrees Fahrenheit, except for Antarctica, where there may be a few degrees off. Can you imagine how tough it would be to get to the solution because you've got people all over the place? But once we coalesce around, wow, guys, it is. It's 32 degrees plus or minus one. We can put those facts into the equation and solve it. And that's what I try to do is how can we bring people together to work together to solve these issues? Now, let's talk about microaggressions. Give listeners a short uh, definition for microaggressions and then share some of that you feel comfortable with. Um, maybe something you've experienced at the hands of um, privileged people or or those that you've come in contact with. You know, it's one of the reasons I wrote Walking the Tightrope. You know, I work for a fantastic company now. It's great. But over my career, I've worked for different companies and in different places. But I do remember one case uh, where a gentleman walked up to me and says, wow, I was wondering if there was anything more to you than just the suit you have on. Just walked up to me and said that. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't make that up. And, and I was floored because I was okay, what did you mean by that? And that was one of those things as if to indict me just on, you know, nothing. And so I, I realized that, and that's just one, I, I have many, uh, I know in one case uh, as a young uh, engineering manager, many, many, many years ago at a company I worked for, and I was new and I came into the organization and there was a gentleman that walked up to my new boss as he was introducing me and he said, do I have to listen to what this guy says and does? And it wasn't a joke, it was serious. And the guy kind of, when my new boss said, yeah, he's your new manager, the guy kind of scoffed and walked off. So those are the things that I've experienced, You know, just a few examples, those are minor examples, but microaggressions are those things that uh, people endure. Uh, they can be comments, they can be behaviors or looks that usually cut at your integrity and cut at you as a person uh, in a very uh, a very disdaining way, mm -hmm. and you just have to deal with it. And a lot of times, people say, "Oh, I didn't know that that kind of thing happens," but it does happen. It happens to this day. I've interviewed a lot of people in different companies around the world, uh, in the U.S. and what have you. And people give me stories of this happened to me and this happens to me all the time. And people say these things. Well, I will say you are a very sharp dressed man, but you also have way more than just the suit going on. You have the leadership and you have the brains and you have the knowledge. And I think that microaggressions can really chisel at your pride and for you to be able to move past those and know that, um, that they're coming your way, but also that they don't define who you are is something that can, can help others. Now, here's sort of a, a million dollar question, but what do you believe people can do to end racism in America? I think first and foremost is an acknowledgement and a recognition of the historical past and things that have occurred. Uh, the next thing I think is to listen. Uh, we, we've got to listen. Uh, again, I talk about common ground. You've heard me talk about this in the past. Common ground, how do we come together? Uh, in my book, I talk about we inhabit one big blue marble. We only have one. And as a famous man once said, we either live together as brothers, and I'll paraphrase as sisters, brothers, sisters and brothers, or we perish as fools. And I believe that's really, really true. Uh, no one really understands the anarchy and the alternatives to the life that we live. It may not be perfect, the environment, but we have to come together to, to work to make this the best place. We have one earth. You know, I, I know there's a lot of talk about going to other planets and doing other things. You know, that may not even occur in our lifetimes, and that's far fetched. But let's take advantage of what we have together. There's so much wonderful uh, collective greatness in the collective body, uh, bringing people together. I always talk about bringing people together for common goals and seeking these lofty, uh, lofty objectives and saying, what can we do 
to raise the and raise and elevate everyone. And that's what I think is so important. And when you do that, it makes us stronger. It makes the country stronger. Uh, it's just like a basketball team, Andrew. You know, you got 12 guys on the team and you only want three to be really good and you forget about the other eight. One of those guys gets hurt or you need them in the championship and you hadn't taught them, you hadn't invested in them. And guess what? You lose the championship. I, I don't want us to lose the big championship. I want us to thrive. And I think that means acknowledging, understanding, and then reaching out, having allyship, coming together to make us collectively stronger. Well, I think that's so true. And one word or two words that we've heard over the past decade, I know me and you both many times is the word collect, words collective impact. And so I think that's true because a rising tide lifts all boats. And I think when we come together and vulnerably and we learn from each other, that's when we can truly grow and prosper in America and around the world. What puts a smile on your face when you look at the uh, the men you've been able to mentor, um, people that have really learned from this book, this documentary, what, what puts a smile on John Jackson's face when you look at the work that you're able to accomplish? I've had responses from all over the world, but there's one uh, from a lady in Toronto, Canada. And she said, John, you're not only speaking to people of color or black people, you're educating and making all of us better. And she wrote that to me and actually texted, got my email and sent me information, sent me a picture of the book that she had purchased. Uh, you don't know, I don't know these people. Uh, and so that means that my vision, my strategy, what I'm trying to pour into the world, what I'm trying to add to the, to the ether, to the ethos of who we are, it's reaching people. I had a lady in Dubai uh, who sent me a message. I don't know who she is, but that means it's working and then I see individual individuals, young men are saying, wow, you know, I'm glad somebody spoke about this because I had the same situation. So I've seen this plethora of things where the work starting from, you know, little old me, the work is going into areas and spaces that I had always dreamed about, but had not envisioned yet. And I just want to push it out even more to show people that there is a way uh, to a much better place. It won't be easy and there'll always be bumps but if we work together collectively and if we come together, there is a much better world out there. And I always use this term, endless opportunities and marvelous possibilities. And, and I think, I, I truly believe that. For those that are sitting in a, um, a place of privilege or access, what can they do to um, eliminate those microaggressions in the workplace? make sure that there is more tools for diversity and inclusion and allow those um, to prosper that have not been able to give an equal chance over decades and hundreds of years? I think one of the things we have to do is this, you know, with George Floyd murder and those things occurring, there was this huge outpouring. We can't let that stop from like a flash in the pan. It has to be continuous. Then I think the, the advice I give everyone who's asked me and been a lot of people in the last couple of years, what I ask that you do is listen, go to individuals of color, people of color, and ask them, what are you experiencing? And then start a conversation. The conversation can't be a, a microwave conversation where you just go in with answers and solutions. Listen intently. And then once you listen and people open up, that is an investment and that is trust. And I think you have to do that. And once you open up and you start to learn, that's when you can start to say, well, things like this need to be corrected. How can we listen more, learn more? How can we affect change? And I think the other thing that's so, so, so important, once you've affected change and once you have not uh, really taken someone's trust and trampled on it, because that's very important. If I, if I trust you with my feelings, don't trample upon them or use them against me. But then once you do that, I think it's really, really important that you look at how do we make changes that are lasting? And how do we make sure that this is a continued process where we are concerned about individuals and really take into account what they experience. Where can people go to learn more about you, your book and documentary? Great, and I'll say one other thing, I'll tell you about the book. One other thing is that if you're people on their social media and they see things and all this kind of stuff, say, hey, hey that's not right. Don't go along with it. Those are, those are very important things if you hear the stuff at work. But yeah, uh, my book, you can uh, buy it on amazon.com or it's on blackbookstore.com. Uh, the documentary is on Amazon Prime Video. It's streaming now. Uh, you can find me at Instagram, d.john underscore Jackson. At Facebook, it's at djohn Jackson. Twitter, it's at djohn lowercase Jackson. And on LinkedIn, it's at djohn Jackson. 
if you'd like to see a trailer, uh, I have a, a website for my company, 5J Entertainment. It's www.5j-entertainment.com. And then just for the book, www.djohnjackson.com. And if you Google it, all those things will pop up, D. John Jackson, but uh, looking to reach out to others and collectively come together and orchestrate a better world for not only us, but for future generations. Thank you for working to power the good in the community and for coming on the City Current Radio Show. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure and you're doing a fantastic job. I appreciate everything you do.